Welcome to Math 11a. This is lecture number eight in week three of the course. Uh, today my goal is to focus on recursive sequences, um, material from uh, chapter 2.2 in the book, but also this will help with some problems from uh, the second homework assignment, I think. So you might want to take a look at this if you're struggling with uh, recursive relationships in that homework assignment as well. Um, I'll do some applications as well as some problems that are uh, interesting for purely mathematical reasons. Here we go. So the first problem I'd like to look at today is a problem that's related to some problems that you've seen before with concentrations of drugs in the bloodstream or catfish in a pond. It's a problem involving a re relationship over time where something both grows in a proportional way and shrinks in a sort of absolute way. So the way that I've set this up is that we imagine that a wealthy benefactor is setting up a scholarship fund, as they do, and this wealthy benefactor decides to give $1 million in year number one for this fund. And the way that scholarship funds often operate is that they're in an account that earns interest, so somebody manages the fund so it earns some good money. Let's say the scholarship fund grows every year, earning 5% interest, which, by the way, is a lot. This is more than you'd find in your average bank. Okay, so every year the fund grows, earning 5% interest, but the fund also has to actually pay the scholarships, and this one is set up to pay $100,000 every year in scholarships. And the first question says, express the amount of money in the fund after t years using a recursive relationship. And remember that it a recursive relationship is one that expresses the amount in the fund in one year as a function of the amount of fund amount in the fund in the previous year. So let's first give the amount of money in the fund a certain name. So I'd say let m sub t be the amount of money in the fund after t years. Or at year number t, if you like. Now, it's given to us that the fund starts with $1 million. in year one. So M1 is equal to 1 million. And the, this isn't the recursive relationship yet. The recursive relationship will tell us what M2 is in terms of M1, and M3 in terms of M2, and so on and so on. And there isn't really a lot of uh, algebraic manipulation involved. It's more a question of can you take a, a real-life situation and express it using symbolic algebra. And what I know is that I have to express, well, for a recursive relationship, is going to have the form, the amount of money in year t has to be something involving m sub t minus 1, the amount of money the previous year. And the way that it depends on the amount of money in the previous year is that the money grows by 5%, and a growth of 5% corresponds to multiplying by 1.05. So if the fund were not paying out any money in scholarships, if it was just growing with interest, then the result would just be m sub t is 1.05 times m sub t minus 1. The money in one year is 1.05 times the amount of money the previous year. But it's also paying out an absolute quantity of $100,000 every year. And so the recursive relationship it's this function of the previous year, 1.05 times the amount of money the previous year, then subtracting $100,000, 
for the amount that goes into scholarships. And that's the function of m sub t minus 1 that describes the recursive relationship. Now, how can we use this? We can make a chart of what happens to the money over time. So in year one, we have a million dollars in the fund. At year two, this is going to increase by 5%, which is $1,050,000. Then I'm going to take away $100,000 to pay the scholarships. And what we're left with is 1,050,000 minus 100,000, which is $950,000. And if we do this again, then we'll make 5% interest on $950,000, which I'll break out the calculator to do. That will be 997,000. $500, but then we have to pay out that same amount, $100,000, and what we're left with is $897,500. And what you'll notice about these numbers, from 1 million that the fund started with to 950,000 next year, to 897,500 the year after, and so on, is that the fund is paying $100,000 every year. It's making interest, but the interest isn't quite enough for the fund to remain stable forever. The fund will eventually run out of money. And one could just plug in the numbers over and over again. And in, I don't know, 20 years, actually, I think a little less than that, the fund will run out of money. An important question for people who plan these things if they want a fund to last forever, if I happen to make a lot of money and donate it to scholarships at the end of my life, then I want my fund to last for 50 years or 100 years. And so what I'll need to know to do this is, first of all, I'll be able to, I have to be able to estimate the amount of interest I can earn over all those years. And I have to know what the balance is, how to balance the amount that I can pay out with that amount of interest so that the fund is sustainable over time. So I'm betting that this is actually less than 20 years the way that this fund is set up. Okay, so this is your uh, very short introduction to how fundraising works and how funds have to be uh, operated in order to be sustainable over time and how a recursive relationship expresses the amount of money in one year as it relates to the money in the previous year. So now I want to describe a recursive sequence that's not applied to directly to fields like biology or economics, but it's used practically to find square roots. And it's been used to find square roots since at least the year 60 of the Common Era. It's uh, due to Heron of Alexandria in his book Metrica. Uh, it's probably much older. It's sometimes called the Babylonian method for estimating square roots. So the starting idea for this method is that if we have two numbers with product n, then one of them will be smaller than the square root of n, and the other will be bigger than the square root of n. Or else, maybe they'll both equal square root of n. So for example, if I have a number like 100, which is 10 times 10, if I have two other numbers that multiply to 100, for example, say, 50 and 2, notice that these lie on opposite sides of the square root. Same thing if I have, say, 25 and 4. One is bigger than the square root, and the other is smaller than the square root. Or if I have, uh, say, 20 and 5. One is bigger than the square root, and the other is smaller than the square root. So this fact can be used to develop a recursive sequence which will estimate the square root of any number. So how do we do this? So suppose... we want to find the square root of 10. So to do this, let me 
start by making a similar diagram. So the number 10 is our number, which I'll call n. 1 is somewhere down here. And the square root of 10 is somewhere in between. And I know that it's a little bit bigger than 3 because the square root of 9 is 3. So 3 is a little bit smaller than the square root of 10, which means that uh, and 3 times 10 thirds These numbers, 3 and 10 thirds, multiply to 10. Therefore, since 3 is a little less than the square root of 10, and 10, its uh, complement, 10 over 3, has to be a little bigger than the square root of n. And one way to estimate the square root of 10 is to say, well, the square root of 10 is going to be somewhere between, so maybe the square root of 10 is approximately the average of 3 and 10 thirds. Because if I know that 3 is a little smaller and 10 thirds is a little bigger, their average should be closer to root 10, at least, than either of these are. And the average of 3 and 10 thirds, if I work out my fractions, this is 1 half. 3 is 9 thirds, 10 thirds. They add to 19 thirds. And this is equal to 19 sixth. Or, in a mixed fraction, this is 3 and 1 sixth. Or in decimals, this is equal to 3.166 repeating. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more general using the language of recursive sequences. What we do is we can let a1, the first term in our sequence, be 3. This will be our first guess, or our first estimate. And the way that I'll produce the next estimate is that I took the average of my previous estimate and 10 divided by the previous estimate. And I did this because one of these numbers will be smaller than root 10 and the other will be bigger because they multiply to 10. And this ended up being 3.16 repeating. And I can repeat this process and the recursive definition is that a sub n will equal the average, so this is my nth estimate, it's the average of the previous estimate so I can keep on producing new estimates from old estimates using this recursive formula and the results will be closer and closer to the square root of 10. So already if I want to produce a3 this will be the average, one-half, of a2, which is 19 sixths, and 10 divided by this. 10 divided by this fraction ends up being 60 nineteenths. And let's break out our calculator to figure out what this is. I'll just use a um, trick, which is that you can use a Google search for a calculator. I want to know that what half of 19 sixth plus 60 nineteenths is, and I get 3.16228. 3.16, I lost it. Three point one six two two eight. So this is my 
third estimate. My first estimate was 3. My second estimate was 3.16 repeating. My third estimate is 3.16228. And let's actually see what the square root of 10 is if I do an estimate on my calculator. I'll use Google as my calculator again. If I estimate the square root of 10, I get 3.16227766, which is very close to 3.16228. So just with two computations with some fractions, converting to decimals, I get an extremely close approximation for the square root of 10. That's the old idea of Heron. If I want a better approximation, I can just do another step and another step and another step, and I get more and more digits of accuracy each time. Now I want to show you some tools which I use to analyze recursive sequences. And so to get started, let's look at the sequence that we just went over. This is the sequence which is determined recursively as follows. The first term of the sequence is the number 3, and each term of the sequence is the average, which means half of the sum, the average of the previous term and 10 over the previous term. It takes a little while to read this kind of notation. When you see a sub n, this is, stands for a term in the sequence. You don't know whether it's the first, the second, the third term. That nth term, which term it is, is that number n there. And if we're referring to term number n, then the previous term is term number n minus 1. That's how you should read this. When I see a sub n, I think, okay, I'm looking at a term in the sequence. And if I see on the same line a sub n minus 1, I say, okay, this is the previous term. In different contexts, this n might be a letter t, especially when it's time, or maybe an i or a j or a k. Different letters are used here, but still it's the relationship that counts. This is a term in the sequence. This is the previous term. We're taking the average of the previous term with 10 divided by the previous term. And the remarkable thing about this sequence, which was known to the ancient Greeks, is that as you go through the terms, they become closer and closer and closer to the square root of 10. So when I analyze these things, I don't use something like Desmos. Um, I program in Python pretty often. So here's a, a Python notebook, and I'll just show you how this works. Uh, of course, I'm not teaching a Python class, but it is worth learning, I think. It's a wonderful language. And I'll upload this uh, Python notebook so that if you do want to learn it, uh, you'll have a little chance by kind of going through the steps. OK, so now I'm in Python. I've written the code here already, and I'll just run through the, the cells in the notebook one at a time. The first is just something which loads some special math and graphics packages into Python. And so I run it and it takes a minute and then it's done. Uh, in this cell, a cell is a little block of Python code. I've told Python that I want to make my simulations go through 20 steps. And then I'm going to make it a little list of numbers. The first is going to be kind of the step numbers. And the second, I'm going to fill a sequence of zeros just to kind of hold the places. So now what I've done is I've really made two lists of numbers, one to keep track of what step I'm at or what time it is. I'm going to look at st time steps 0 through 19. And my sequence is initialized to a big sequence of zeros. And then I'm going to use a programming construct called a loop. And the way that this works is that here I'm setting the first term in the sequence to be 3. Now Python, instead of calling the first term, they call the zeroth term. This a bracket 0 plays the role of a sub 1 here because Python likes its uh, sequences to start at 0. And then this 4t in range 1 to t max, this is going to go through my 20 steps. All at once, it'll take just a, you know, a microsecond or something. Um, and here's the sequence of numbers that comes out of this. Out of this. So when I go through, here it is. And we see uh, the numbers that I saw before, 3.16 repeating, 3.16228, 3.16227766, 3 and so on and so on. If I want to compare this to the actual square root of 2, it's quite close. The, sorry, the square root of 10. The square root of 10 is 3.16227766016837695. And I've gotten within 10 digits of accuracy with only about four steps of this process. It's a very quick way of estimating square roots. And so what this did, just to review, is it actually computed the terms in this recursive sequence. The formula 
that one half of the previous term plus 10 over the previous term is right here. Here's 0 0.5, which is a half, multiplied by the previous term plus 10 over the previous term. It looks a lot like the formula here. That's how you implement it in Python. Now, if I want to graph this, I'll use a little graphing tool called matplotlib to do it. Uh, it looks like this. So the first term of the sequence is 0. The next term is 3 and a sixth. And then it goes down a little bit to 3.1622. And it stays very, very close to there. It converges. This sequence converges. And its limit is precisely the square root of 10. This line stabilizes, stabilizes, gets closer and closer and closer and closer to the square root of 10. It never actually uh, hits the square root of 10 on the nose. The reason is that square root of 10 is an irrational number, but all the terms in the sequence are actually rational numbers. So it doesn't actually hit it on the nose, but the limit is actually equal to the square root of 10. It gets within any little ball around the square root of 10 that I could possibly draw. Now I want to show you another sequence using Python. The next sequence that I want to show you is one that occurs in the homework. It's called the logistic sequence, or the discrete logistic equation. And this works by saying, let's let a sub 1 be some small number. You might take 0 0.1. It doesn't actually have a great effect on it, as long as it's pretty small. And then each term in the sequence is some constant, we'll call it c, times the previous term times 1 minus the previous term. And this number c is something that you have to choose. So you might try c is 1, or c is 2, c is 3, c is, it can, doesn't have to be a whole number, it could be 3.5 etc. Okay, so let's model this. I'll show you how I do this in Python. I'm going to look at 20 steps of the sequence again and set up my arrays. I'm going to try setting that constant to be 2. I'm going to study the logistic equation with this constant equal to 2 starting at point 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out the list of numbers, and produce the graph, kind of all at one step. So here's my list of numbers. If c is 2, then the sequence goes 0 0.1, 0 0.18, 0 0.295, and in the limit, it approaches 0.5. And you can see this in a graph pretty easily. Here's 0 0.5. In a sequence, it goes up, 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 and then it approaches this line with ever, without ever really reaching it. These are 0 0.5s, but those are rounded just a little bit. So it gets closer and closer and closer. And in the limit, it approaches 0 0.5. Now, what is this meant to model? This is meant to model population growth in an environment where there's kind of a fixed capacity for whatever you're studying the population of. So if you want to think about bacteria growing in a plate, that plate can only hold a certain number of bacteria. If you start them growing, so they reproduce, you get some exponential growth curve. But then as it approaches the carrying capacity of the plate, it starts to level off until it reaches capacity. This is what this is meant to model. Uh, this goes back, I think, at least 100 years or so. It's due to uh, Verholst. Um, so you can search for that that name and find out more. Now, what is really interesting about this one is that it's highly dependent on this parameter c. C is something like the population growth rate. If I change c from 2 up to 3 and rerun this, a lot of things change. One thing that changes is that this 
carrying capacity, this line here moved up from 0.5 to 0.667, moved up to two thirds in fact. But that's not all that changed. What changes here is that the population grows, 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 and it actually exceeds the capacity. And then it decreases, and then it increases, decreases, increases, and it has this oscillating behavior. This is what happens if you have a population which grows beyond the capacity of its environment. So you can imagine it reproduces, but then it exceeds the capacity. Maybe it starts starving and drops. And then it's below capacity, so it eats a little too much. It reproduces too fast, it exceeds. Down, up, down, up, down, up. There isn't an equation which tells you the value at a certain amount of time, but at least the behavior is pretty predictable in this up-down fashion when this growth rate parameter, this C parameter, is 3. Now something more interesting happens when I set C to be a slightly larger number, like 3.5. If I run the simulation again, remember this is the same equation. This is the recursive sequence which starts at 0 0.1, and each term is this C parameter times the previous term times 1 minus the previous term. All that I'm changing is this C parameter. In this case, the dynamics are more complicated. It grows a little too fast, exceeds capacity, dies off, gets below capacity, grows, goes beyond capacity, dies off, grows down, up, down, up, down. And it actually has a sort of four-term oscillation, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. But some of the highs and lows are not as high and low as the others. So there are sort of four possible locations for these peaks and valleys and it stays along this kind of oscillation pattern throughout. It's sort of an unusual dynamics right here. And if I go a little higher on the C parameter, I'll show you one more. We start to get some really chaotic behavior. Now the growth parameter is very high. It sweeps up very quickly beyond capacity. Then there's a massive die off. Then it grows again, dies off, grows, gets way beyond capacity, massive die-off. Grows, dies off, grows, dies off, and almost gets down to zero. There's barely anything left. Then it starts to start that climb again. When the growth parameter is too large, you'll find this kind of chaotic behavior of massive uh, excessive growth followed by excessive dying off. And this is completely unpredictable. There is no formula that'll tell you what the population will be after a thousand steps because of this chaotic behavior. Now there's an interesting diagram which I'll show you before moving on, which is that people have studied this for all different C parameters at once, and the following code does this. This is a little Python code. And what it did in that little microsecond is actually computed about, I think, 30,000 different possibilities for um, about 300 different C parameters. And putting together the graphs, I get this. Now what is this graph? On the x-axis I've shown you the C parameter, how fast the population is growing. And the y-axis I've shown the dynamics of how the population changes. Now when the C parameter is small like 2, the limit is 0.5 and it gets towards that limit and stays there. When C is 3, right around here, when C is 3, it oscillates above and below two-thirds. It goes between the point up here and the point down there, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between this point and this point. When C is 3.5, you see there are four points above this line, and the dynamics oscillates between these four values. That's where the population oscillates. And when you get much beyond 3.5, things are much more chaotic. The population doesn't oscillate between just a few values. It's sort of oscillates all over the place, maybe within some limits. Now there is a very strange thing inside of this window. You can see a little bit of a light space here, if it shows up on your video. There's a light space where in fact it oscillates between three values. So there's some very interesting mathematics here. People spend their life studying things like this, about how the dynamics of a recursive sequence depend on a simple parameter, this single number c, which you put into it. Population dynamics are difficult to work with, and they can be unpredictable. Um, and for mathematicians, it's a very interesting thing to study.